Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, another webinar of the Media Education Lab. Uh, we're happy to have all of you. And this is uh, a series that we're doing uh, here in collaboration to talk about um, gaming and learning and critical analysis. And I just want to start with saying, I'll put in the chat that all of you are welcome to our Media Ed Forum that has one session about um, gaming in uh, Poland and also in the US as part of a two-day online conference, January 12th and um, uh, 13. So I'll put the information in the chat for those who are uh, interested. And then I'll let uh, Karis and Virginia uh, take it away. Thanks. Thank you so much. Karis, I don't know if you wanna give some words of welcome and then I can do some business. Uh, yes, absolutely. Hello and welcome. Um, we are here representing the Critical um, Gaming Literacies Group um, from the Literacy Research Association. Um, we have been doing a series of webinars around gaming and critical literacy. Um, and we are really happy to be hosting this webinar um, today, which is on both learning to facilitate and make games. Um, and we have a fabulous uh, panel for you today. So I'll pass it to my co-host who is going to tell you a little more about um, a research study that we are doing. Thank you, Kara. So we are conducting a study and trying to learn more as a group that's engaged in thinking about um, games, gaming, and how that might bring learning opportunities to children in the classroom and to educators um, in all sorts of spaces. Uh, we are asking for educators to consent to participate in this study. Um, and what I'm going to drop in the chat right now is a link to information about the study. Um, basically, we're sending out, if you consent to participate, we'll send out a survey, ask you to answer a few questions, um, and, uh, and then you'll um, potentially be contacted for a follow-up interview. Um, and we really appreciate this. As, as researchers and educators, we want to know more about um, how our work can serve the field and create great opportunities for learners to engage in gaming and play. So that link's in there. And I want to say that we're open to anyone filling out that survey, whether you have a lot of experience or if this is your first time learning about it. We're, we're still interested in hearing from you. All right. So then we're going to pass it over to our facilitator, Kelly. Take it away. All right. First of all, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the Learning Design and Play. Uh, how to make games and teach them. Um, just sorry, I'm getting set up because I couldn't get in at first. So let's see. Um, while there we go. Um, so I am. Uh, let, I'll go ahead and give you a little bit about what the what we're, the day is going to look like. This hour is going to look like. Um, we're going to have. The moderated panel and then i'm your moderator my name is kelly smith um i'm a doctoral candidate at the university of arizona and i'm currently exploring um, how augmented reality can be used in environmental education so i'm uh designed an experience using augmented reality um through place responsive design uh and the big thing about this is uh, the big thing i'm working on with this is to uh this panel is just to um, make sure that uh, you know facilitate the panel discussion while honoring the time that we have for small groups at the end of the discussion because I think that's a really important part that we of the whole experience today. Um, and, and if you're here for the last webinar, this could be pretty much the same sort of thing. So the first 20 25 minutes we'll be going uh, doing the questions for the panel and then we'll go into breakout rooms after that and have about five minutes to wrap up. Um, go ahead and uh, introduce our panelists and ask your um ask the panelists to kind of just go in order as we have it on there and just uh, say your name and um tell us where you're connecting from because we're gonna get in, get into the questions right away right um i'm hannah this is brennan dietrich we are from conroe texas 
I'm currently a professor of writing at University of Houston Clear Lake and uh, I do game development and game design for a small indie TTRPG company. Thank you. Hey. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Faye. Um, I'm not sure if my name, I, I was trying to change my name on the little thing there, but I haven't figured it out yet. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm a PhD student at uh, the Ohio State University. Um, I uh, am planning to do my dissertation research on uh, role-playing games, and I am just a gigantic raging nerd about them um, and have been playing them for many years and uh, uh, enjoy hacking them together and making up new things around them and, and running those games. Um, yeah, any any kind of story I love, but especially the kinds of stories you can live inside. Um, yeah. Thank you. And Matthew? Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Coupleton. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I am currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts uh, Interactive Media and Games Division um, in Los Angeles. Um, I am an educator, game design teacher. I teach game design. Um, used to teach language arts and social studies at the high school level. Um, I'm a learning researcher and an educational game designer. All right, uh, thank you. Um everyone for taking part in this panel. I'm really excited to hear what uh, what your answers to the questions are as we go along here, everyone. Um, so our first question, kind of a basic question, uh, to tell us a little bit more about yourself. So, you know, what are your experiences in teaching or making games? Um, I get, we'll just go the same order for this one. Mm -hmm. Um, so experience in teaching, um, I was also a high school English and social study teacher. My wife taught English at the high school and college level. Um, as far as making games, like I said, we do uh, TTRPGs. We write adventure modules that kind of go with um, Dungeons and Dragons using that rule set. Um, I'm also coaching right now a couple other writers on developing their own systems for engaging some in the classroom, some just making really cool games. Um, so that's the experience we have there. Um, our company is about two years old now. We've had five successful Kickstarters. Uh, crowdfunding is kind of our jam, and we're just having a blast doing that. Hey, uh, Faye, how about you? What are your experiences in teaching or making games? Yeah, I um, I think there was there was also a request in the chat um, to uh, talk about the very cute baby that you guys uh, you guys have. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I can go. I'm no baby, uh, but you know, I'll do my best. I um let's see. Uh yeah. So I mean, like I said, uh I've been playing and uh running uh mostly tabletop RPGs, some live action. Oh, thanks, Deb. Um, <laughs> um some uh live action role playing uh games as well. Um and so, I mean, most of my experience in making them has primarily been in sort of hacking together my own systems to suit the, the to do the kinds of things that I want to do in the games that I'm playing and running for for uh, other people. Um, yeah, I'm not uh, operating at the that kind of professional publishing level, but um, I do. I I, um, I definitely have uh, thoughts and opinions about Dungeons and Dragons, and uh, am I, I'm personally more interested in other systems. There's a huge variety of other stuff out there, and um, although you know I have no no problem with D and D, um, it's it's wonderful uh, for you know for many people. I think uh, at the moment, I just I love exploring uh, the many like more independent systems that are out there, and and uh, uh, yeah. Um, so I, I can argue with you guys about that uh, at any point if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Matthew. So I, I started um, using games in the classroom when I was a language arts and social studies teacher. Um, and I also started modifying them and making my own and co-designing games with students and, and colleagues. Um, and a lot of that was for um, social emotional learning. So doing things like theater of the oppressed games, um, 
really to build a sense of camaraderie and community in the classroom. Um, I was engaging uh, students who had been disengaged, basically pushed out of public schools, often because of racist and carceral discipline policies. And my job was to re-engage them with learning um, and if they wanted with school. So um, games helped with, with that to create that sense of community. I also started to find out, um, I was involved in abolitionist organizing. So abolitionism, uh, for folks who don't know, is the movement to abolish police and prisons, builds on the historic movement to abolish slavery. Um, I was supporting young people and trying to abolish the um, youth jail, um, youth juvenile detention center in Seattle. And in the course of organizing actions and other events related to that campaign, um, friends and I started to design games that would imagine that we just started to design games in order to imagine a future where that jail no longer exists. Um, and that was a range of theater and role-playing games. Um, and we, at one point we surrounded the jail with theater and role-playing games as a demonstration. That was really fun. Um, and then based on the world that we started to imagine would replace this sort of prison society, um, eventually I turned that into a video game, which is Kai on Earth. You can see um, a screenshot from it here in the background. That's still in development. Hopefully it'll be out this summer. There is a Twine version of playable interactive text, just, just the text, just the storyline of it available now um, at kaionearth.com. I'll drop a link to that. Um, I made some other video games as well, like a, 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 a reading accessibility aid called Lo-Fi Lo Hip Hop Worlds to Study In. Uh, which was designed to help people studying during remote learning in the pandemic, people who live in loud environments. Like I live here in South Central LA, there's police helicopters overhead all the time. And, you know, made the game for other people in these kinds of situations who maybe get overstimulated and, you know, need to curate their own soundscape to read. So, um, yeah, um, now I'm making climate justice games. Kai on Earth is a climate justice game, a climate justice meaning, you know, addressing climate change in an anti-racist way. Um, Kai on Earth is imagining that a world without fossil fuels, uh, and I'm working on a sequel now that's going to focus on on uh, on climate justice activism and taking action in the near future. Very cool. Um, may thank you may I sure. add on to that very briefly? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I um, you just reminded me. Uh, it's a a different project, but um, the the main thing that I'm going to be working on next semester as part of my um, program is a project uh, in which I'm planning to run a series of three games, um, which will be uh, the first two are more world building exercises. And then the third is like playing characters within that world, um, uh, mostly with my <laughs> queer weird friends um, uh, centered around imagining a uh, people living in a queer community in like a post-apocalyptic future. Um, but one in which uh, the, you know, there are new things growing up through the cracks sort of forming in the, in the world. And just what you said about um, imagining a future in which different ways of living are, are possible um, is so, um, yeah, so resonant uh, for me. I think like, you know, I'm under no, <laughs> no illusions that like, uh, playing tabletop RPGs is gonna like save, you know, fix things, fix things, not directly, but like uh, I think it is, it is so important. Like to, I, I do think it's meaningful um, to imagine uh, futures that are more just and more uh, that that are that are different, you know, than the ones that we've been handed. Because as I think part of what you were getting at is like, um, or what I heard in what you were saying was that uh you know how how can we make these things real unless we can imagine them first right um thank you so um next set of questions uh kind of We'll go question by question, and if any of the panelists have something they would like to uh, uh, have a response to it, uh, ask you to go ahead and kind of jump in on that, and um, kind of like what we just did. So what kind of considerations do you have as you design a game? Um, you know, when you're designing Kai on Earth and looking for that environmental justice um, 
fighting eco apartheid, that type of thing? What kind of what kind of what kind of uh, considerations do you have to have at the foundation of that, or if any of the games that are any of the games that are being designed as you do? Okay. Are we going in order, or should we just jump in? I think we just have to jump in on these ones. Anyone want to want to talk about? Uh, sure, I'll jump in on the first one first because you know I'm a logical guy. Um, so, mm -hmm. kinds of considerations uh, when we're looking at designing a game uh, because we're educators and we hear buzzwords all the time. Uh, the two that actually like stick out specific for us is uh, accessibility and approachability, um, and the difference between them and the nuances there of making sure that whatever it is that we're designing, if our target audience is students, if it's people that have never played a game, if it's something that direction, uh, making sure, first of all, we give them all of the different things we need to possibly make the game accessible. Um, if you've never played an RPG before, sitting down by like throwing a bunch of acronyms at you is not going to be helpful. Um, it's sitting down, making sure we have those terms in the right ways, making sure we aren't just saying, cool, grab a D12. We're explaining, like, what do these things mean, even though as you're playing games, it becomes secondhand. Um, but especially with new people coming in, they just don't know. Um, the other big thing is, especially with approachability, is a lot of people, maybe they don't want to play XYZ kind of game because they've always heard it's too complicated or they think they're not smart enough or they think any number of variations of things. Uh, with TTRPGs, the big complaint we heard getting into it was, man, I don't have six or eight hours to sit around and we're like, cool. So you have like an hour and a half because we can have a great experience that way. Um, so we started designing games more in those kind of bite-sized environments um, with the kind of built-in adaptations for brand new people coming into play with um, those kind of things in mind. Thank you, Carter. <laughs> No, okay. All right. Um, Matthew, how about you? Before I answer this, I just wanted to say, um, Faye, that sounds really, really cool. I'd love to hear more about that. I might respond a little bit in chat. Um, so, yeah, so um, I use a, a, a critical or kind of anti-racist version of what's called a play-centric design method. Um, this is the method that's taught um, in the USC Games program where I'm, I'm uh, working now. Um, it's developed by Tracy Fullerton and um, other sort of um, experimental game designers and educators. Um, so this involves treating games like an experience, not like a product or a system. We're not trying to create, you know, we're not trying to make games in new textbooks that are going to solve all our educational problems. We know that that's not going to happen, right? It's about designing, a, in this case, a learning experience. Uh, so to do that, uh, we set an experience goal. So a goal for what we want the player to feel. So for example, a game that I'm brainstorming right now, the experience goal is um, players will feel motivated to have conversations about extreme weather events in their areas um, so that those conversations can become about anti-racism and in turn will motivate them and others to take collective action around climate justice. So there's an arc of experiences there we want people to have, right? And when you're making an educational game, it's important to attune that arc to the learning goals that, you know, what you want people to learn, right? Um, so we could talk about that in terms of scaffolding or making sure people have, you know, at each step of the way they have, um, they're building the knowledge they need to go on to the next experience. Um, and then we play test, we, we build a prototype of a game that's a rough version, it's not polished. Um, and then we invite people to play it and we see what happens because you can never predict what happens. Games are interactive media. You never know what people are going to do with your game, no matter how best, you know, how, no matter how good you are at design or teaching, you, you can never predict, right? So you have to play test a lot, see what happens, see if they're having the experience you want them to have, uh, and then go from there. Maybe change the game to co go closer to that experience, or maybe they generate a new experience that's even better and you go in that direction. You go through that iterative process over and over again. What makes it critical in this case is that the, the experience goals are critical learning. Um, and also, I think it's important in play tests to be culturally responsive and aware of, you know, who is the designer? What's their positionality? Who's doing the play test? What is their positionality? Thinking about privilege and oppression, things like this, right? Um, who's playing it and testing the games with the audience that you have, the group that you actually want to play um, and, and inviting them to make the game their own too. Um, before we move on to... Uh... Hey, uh, Matthew had a Matthew had a question in chat for you. It's like, can you clarify what makes the experience anti-racist? 
So choosing anti-racist experience goals in this case, and then, yeah, being aware of, also being aware of, um, of issues of race, maybe white supremacy or institutional racism, um, when we, when we consider the positionality of the designer as well. Um, so, um, for example, like I, I collaborate with black folks to make Afrofuturist games, right? It's not about me, uh, cl claiming some control over Afrofuturism that would not be appropriate, right? It's about inviting players and learners to make, to make their own Afrofuturist worlds, to imagine black liberation, right? Um, so there's a little more attention in this case to the designer's positionality than there is in sort of traditional game design programs where it's often the designer sort of catering to a player and really centering the player's experience. That's important, that empathy is important, but we also need to be aware of our own positionality as we do this. And, it, you know, when I, when I teach, you know, when I support, you know, um, black designers, you know, especially, you know, abolitionist designers, um, it's also about encouraging, encouraging them to build on the play aesthetics and the strengths of their own communities, like what, what their communities are already doing right around this and building games that build on that, on those strengths. Thank you. Uh, Faye, did you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I have lots of thoughts, <laughs> so I'll try and condense them. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, both of, uh, both of, uh, uh, both of you said some really, really insightful things. Um, and so I'll try not to recover ground, but, um, yeah, I think, uh, a lot of what, um, uh, I heard being addressed, uh, in y'all's comments was like, um, focusing on theme, on, uh, audience, on who is this for, why are we making it, what's the the, what's the sort of central uh, idea? And I think uh, you were also touching uh, too um, on uh, experience or like the um, action, right? And I think that's like, for me, I think when I'm thinking about a game, um, whether it's just one I want to run or one that I'm trying to, trying to make, uh, I think so much of it boils down. Like it's easy to... <laughs> At least for me, it's easy to get kind of lost in the sauce and be have have a lot of um, fun or like, uh, you know, just just get deep into the complexity of like how this thing is going to work in your mind. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, a game comes to life when it is played. Right. And so it, it is it's about um, it's about action. Right. And so the uh, core questions to consider um, and I'm sort of cribbing this from. What are called the big uh, the uh, what are called the big three in in um, like game designer lingo. Um, a core question to consider, and it sounds sort of obvious, maybe, is just like what are what are people actually doing when they're playing this game? Both like the players themselves physically, like are they um, are they manipulating you know props? Are they rolling dice? Are they moving? Are they going to be writing things down on you know like physically? What are they doing socially? What are they doing? What's the what is the um, uh, what's the dynamic uh, set up between them? How is like narrative agency and power distributed? Um, and uh, and also like what are what are the characters going to be doing? Assuming this is a, a tabletop role playing game of some kind, um, how how do you want people to engage in the world in a you know and and as you said like <laughs> um, part of the thing about games right is you can never fully predict what people are going to do with a game uh you can't control that but what you can do is incentivize certain behaviors or incentivize or or reinforce um or or um highlight um certain things right um so for instance if you're making a system and uh all, all of the rules have to do with combat right and uh there's a huge amount of detail and like um uh, power is all focused on like how you can hit things <laughs> more effectively in various ways, then of course, um, people who play the game are going to tend to engage with that, th those sorts of actions, right? Um, and uh, yeah, and so I think like designing, to I mean, again, it sounds sort of simple, but it's easy to forget in my experience is like, really thinking about um, in a very like, uh, in as fine grained a way as possible, what you want the the players to be doing, um, what you want the ca the characters or or whatever you know they're the sort of fictional um, uh, pieces of elements of the game world to be doing, and how the rule the systems that you're setting up both the both the explicit mechanical system 
systems and the and the less and the more implicit sort of social dynamics of the of the table, how those things relate to reinforce um, uh, incentivize, et cetera, like the, both those behaviors and the the core themes or ideas that you're trying to build the the game around. Um, because I think uh, another thing I, I, I think uh, some of the other folks were getting at is that it, it can be really easy to to just um, uh, <laughs> have have certain sets of assumptions about what a game is or what it will look like or what people will do um, and how the various pieces of it all relate and to just let those assumptions unconsciously drive whatever it is that you're making. And so, you know, you were talking about positionality. It's it's really important to like to whatever degree is possible for, uh, you know, for us to really think um, deeply, as deeply and critically as we can about um, who am I? Where am I coming from? What assumptions do I have about what uh, worlds look like, what games look like, what stories look like, what characters are, you know, and how is that informing my design? And then, because then if you start doing that, the more you do that, the more you can um, uh, free yourself up to make choices about uh what you're doing and how you're designing rather than just being driven by uh you know the the sort of tides of <laughs> cultural programming whatever that that you may not even be uh, aware of um okay i think that's I, i'm gonna step down off my soapbox now <laughs> thanks <laughs> all right um thank you um and if you haven't if you have any questions as we're going along feel free to uh put them into the chat and I or someone else will snag them as we're going along. Uh, so how do you think about youth learning through games? This is for the panelists. Yeah. And, and how do games facilitate learning? We've kind of been touching on that a little bit, I think. But um, uh, let's go ahead. It looks like Anna and Brandon, go for it. <laughs> Uh, one thing that I would just say about that is I think that one of the like goals that we have um, when he was leading a group at the high school, and then we also have like a local game store that plays some of our games. And there's like a youth um, kind of a group of students that uh, regularly attend and play some of the games, um, both for playtesting and also just to enjoy and get to know each other and have a place to like connect and have community. Um, but one of the goals is really um, much like reading, you know, it fits well with literacy because um when the students come in and they participate in something like a tabletop role-playing game, they end up really um, kind of adopting a lived experience outside of their own. And so through that, they're able to see kind of where other people are coming from and how people function in different worlds or from different perspectives. And I think um, beyond like any specific end goal of what we want them to empathize with, one of our key goals is to help students uh, like experience and understand what it means to empathize at all, you know? Um, and then once they've developed this ability to empathize and see that people are coming to the table from different perspectives and from different worlds and kind of to like throw themselves into the shoes of a different character's worldview, um, then it really helps them to develop as a person and be a better contributor to community and our culture and all of that as well. Um, I think I think it was Matthew that brought up the social emotional learning and that to me that's one of the big reasons why we play RPGs and that kind of a thing much like reading the old books although if you give a classic book to a high schooler chance or they're just going to drop it in their backpack and forget about it um, but if we can get them to sit at a table and roll some dice and kind of hang out that way we can engage in those stories we can engage not just in the stories of the characters but inevitably the people playing the characters parts of their personality are going to come out and they can test things at the table to see like is this part of who they are as they're shaping their personality and as they're experiencing different things and it can be a really I don't know I feel like the term safe space is overused but it it is mm -hmm. it's that safe environment where they can kind of imagine different things and what it could be like and having those social interactions with people around them that as they're adventuring together they're all kind of in the story together. Uh -huh. And they can do something really wrong, yep. and it's just in a game, right? Yep. And they get to learn that that's not really a, something you should do outside of a game ever. So uh, let's just like, leave it on the table and move on. Yep. No worries about loss of face because it's a game. It's just a character. If they end up not liking that character, they inevitably kill them off and start a different one. <laughs> and that's just kind of how 
we've been able to see awesome growth in that direction. So I can, I can build on that. Um, so a lot of the education research literature on game-based learning is about learning computational thinking. Um, it's in STEM, you know, uh, so, you know, learning how to code through making games. That's all well and good. Certainly we need more, you know, equity in the game design industry. Um, so if educators can help with that, that's good. But what I appreciate about this panel, everybody here, and um, also particularly the work that Karis and her colleagues have been doing is it also, it, it, it asks, we're all, we're all kind of asking how this can be done in, um, in language arts and social study, in social studies as well. And I think that's really important. That's a new sort of newer development. Um, and I think world building is really key there. Um, I think it's key for game, game-based learning in general too, even on the computational thinking side. Um, this is, this is what I found through my dissertation research. We, um, we did a play test of Kai Unearthed, um, and, uh, we didn't just ask people for feedback, but we also invited them to make their own games. And this was a group of, um, of young people in their early twenties, uh, mostly black, uh, and about half non-binary folks. Um, and they gave great feedback on the game and they also made their own games that, um, imagine liberated futures and challenge systemic oppression. Many of them drew from Afrofuturism and sort of developed Afrofuturistic worlds. For example, Brianna Mims developed an abolitionist world building tabletop game in which players, uh, it's very similar to what you're describing, Faye, like players imagine a community without police and prisons and role play dynamics in that community. Um, and She's play tested that inside of Norco prison. She's play tested it in Ghana, uh, in Senegal, um, across the US. Um, so lots of great feedback on that game. Um, and what I'm noticing is, you know, in her own development, right, is she didn't consider herself a game designer at first. She was an activist, an abolitionist activist and artist. Um, she got involved in games because she wanted more strat develop more strategies for abolitionist act actions, right? And she built these worlds and invited players to build these worlds. and calls herself a world builder, right? And through world building, she's doing all these things that educators consider to be, you know, high level computational literacies, right? Like using different variables to sort of approximate different social dynamics and looking at how those are balanced and the procedures and stuff, procedurality, procedural rhetoric and stuff through the game. Um, I can share more about that in the breakout if folks want, but, um, you know, so starting with the arts, starting with storytelling, you know, I think is important here. And yes, it did have some STEM outcomes, right? But is that the point? I mean, that that is a point, but also the fact is she's building abolitionist worlds at a moment where we really need those. Um, so I can also share more later if folks want. I've been talking with Tracy Fullerton and others about using games as texts, games as literature in the classroom. I think that's a great place for language arts teachers to start. And that also, also involves world building, of course. Um, building on the work of people like Stephanie Tolliver, who uses um, Afrofuturist texts in the classroom. Uh, thanks, Matthew. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Um, I definitely would like to talk more. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, I just wanted to add on. Um, so there's this page in uh, a game, one of the one of the three games that I'm planning to run uh, called Dream Askew by Avery Alder. Um, and the, there's a, um, the, the section in it is called Emergent Teaching. And it's basically a page, a sort of primer on how to teach people how to play the game, you know? Um, and, you know, it says there's no one right way to do that, but there are four principles that I just wanna share because I think they're so, um, they're so insightful and so relevant, not just for teaching games, but just for, like for teaching in general. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm not a um, licensed teacher, but I have had uh, experiences as an as an educator, or not a licensed K twelve teacher, but you know, I teach college. I've been a substitute teacher. Um, uh, my parents are educators, etc. Um, uh, anyway, the four principles are uh, one: teach the concepts and context players need to make their next decision, and then take it from there. Um, so, like. You know, it's so it's so easy when we have, you know, I have all this information, right? I have I, I know so much about the world or the system. I, I've been doing all of this research or making up this this incredibly uh, intricate, you know, history for this world. And you want to share it all. Right. Um, but obviously that can overwhelm people because they don't know what you know. And I think it's it's just a wonderful um, uh, rule of thumb, basically, is just like, again, focus on like. What's the minimum amount they need to know to do something? Um, 
And like, I, I mean, I, I feel like that, you know, can work very well in a classroom too, if you're just like, okay, I want, <laughs> I want the kids to be able to do something. What do they need to know? What's the minimum scaffolding to make that happen? Um, related to that, the next one is uh, teach to the curiosity of the players answering questions as they come up. So, so shifting the focus from you as the sort of font of knowledge to a, um, facilitator and guide for their questions, for their curiosity, um, letting the players, you know, or the students or whoever guide you, guide the the content, uh, at least to the extent that like, the focus is on uh, what do you wanna know? And then I can help you figure that out. Um, whether that's about the world that you're, that we're exploring together or about some aspect of like, you know, uh, more more uh, abstract information or the system that we're using to play this game. Um, and then use examples. And the fourth one is mo model it clearly through play. So like, um, just uh, w once again, it's just like the idea of, and, and, and this is really, I think, why I'm talking, you know, talking about games specifically. Um, part of what the, I think they're so good at is, um, that everything in a game, um, all of the, the the system, the world, et cetera, like it only matters insofar as it is used and engaged with. Um, it only becomes real when it becomes part of play, um, when it becomes part of uh, things that people are doing in the in the shared world. And so like even the extremely abstract, the most abstract information, you know, like numbers on your character sheet or whatever, they're meaningless until they are applied in the context uh, that that we're you know, building together. And um, it's so easy, I think, to <laughs> fall into the trap um, of just giving people contextless information, right? Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I think games can can really help us kind of get around that um, because they uh, are entirely about um, creating a shared context in which to apply that, that information. Um, yeah. I think that's it. <laughs> I could go on again, probably. I'll stop. Um, thanks. Um, if, I want to honor our time and be able to break out into uh, small groups. But before that, there was a, a question in chat from Mallory where they, they were asking, um, I was wondering from a community perspective, how do you establish buy-in to engage in a game? My organization is considering engaging the community in positive health practices of using games and AR. So how do you how do you establish that buy-in to engage with it? Um, so I'm gonna jump in there quick. I think my immediate question is just gonna be like, what kind of community? Um, but I think my advice can still apply regardless of the answer to that one. The first one is go wherever the people are. If you've got a community center, if you've got um, where we are, local game stores are actually like, it's a big thing and people love it and it's awesome. And um, so we could go into those places or go to a community center or go to a really popular park and just whatever your game is, just start playing it. And as you guys are playing it and having fun, that's going to draw a lot of attention. Um, we found that's been super successful as well as old school flyer campaigns. There's community boards all over the place at coffee shops, at delis, at sandwich shops, at wherever, um, getting the word out that way. If you've got somebody that's halfway competent at social media, like get on those social media boards, find your face group, Facebook group, or if you have a local area Discord group, something like that. And that's gonna be kind of where you start getting those grassroots movements and it's gonna probably take time. Um, those kind of things, especially if you're starting, starting from ground zero, they just take time to build up. Um, so figure out who your passionate people are about whatever the project is you're doing and give them the lead, like give them the reins on it of just if you've got that super extroverted, the bubbly personality, ask them, hey, where could you go to find people? And then kind of have that work more organically. Very Isn't briefly. No, go ahead, go ahead, please. I was saying uh, you also aware of what networks already exist in your immediate community you know uh, the more that we've invested ourselves in like um the more that like people have just come out of the woodwork is like oh i do that um and so um like if you're verbal about like what you're interested in and what you're interested in, i think you're gonna find that 
whatever like your path you're in or whatever like you find yourself in there are people in your surrounding area that are already somewhat invested in that and so then just building off of those existing interests i think probably one of the challenging things is um to make sure that uh that it doesn't twist so that our goals and our purposes and what we want to educate people on through the games um doesn't become the only focus right people play games because they're fun and so um, emphasizing you know the community like table space and emphasizing that like conversation like most of the time we have like there's food involved right you get to get together with people that you love already um or build new relationships with people that you're looking to build new relationships with and then allowing that to lead into the education rather than saying hey i think you're all wrong about this thing and we need to um shift your perspective through a game not really an attractive way to get people involved and so um although some people might be motivated to look outside of themselves from the beginning it is um uh, most of the time, the reason game education works is because people want to play a game. Uh, very briefly, too, I don't, I mean, this isn't my great area of expertise, so I'm not going to say very much, but my uh, instinct tells me that, um, so, like, when I'm trying to find people to play a game, basically, and reaching out to community of players, um, using a session zero, um, and session zero is basically like a technique uh, to get people who are interested to get, you know, to sort of cross the uh, gap from interested to engaged or bought in. And really, all it boils down to is just like sitting down with people who have expressed interest in what you're doing, and um, talking, talking to them, you know, asking questions together, like, uh, what kind of game do we want to play? What sorts of things do we want to see in the game? What don't we want to see in the game? How can we make sure that everybody's like, you know, has one another's safety in mind? And like, um, what kinds of themes are we going to explore? Uh, what, what is this? How does this game work? You know, th that, you know, and then, you know, some might like, that might be the time when you make characters, etc. Um, and sort of start getting into the world. Um, but uh, it can look like anything, and I think I think if I know you're talking about an AR game, but if there are people who are interested in what you're doing and are willing to sit down with you for half an hour, um, and uh, you can talk to them and use their input to whatever degree possible to shape what you're doing, and then I think that that definitely helps with with buy-in. Um. Um. Like to make sure we have enough time to uh, work in the uh, breakout rooms. So I think basically we're probably going to have uh, two breakout rooms. Um, there'll be one on making games, where uh, Hannah and Brandon and uh, Matthew will be in that one, and then there will be one on teaching games, where Faye and I will be in that one. Um, and I would be happy to be in the third one if people yep. want to pop in for an individual discussion. It sounds like some people have very specific um, context they want to talk through, and that would be fine. I can sit in there. Okay, awesome. Um, Are you all set up? Do you need me help to make them, or did you make them? I am all set up. So what's going to awesome. happen <laughs> is that I'm going to open the room. You're going to be able to choose which room you want to be in, um, and then we are going to come back with the last five minutes uh, to share the survey. Uh, Virginia will talk to us about that. So 10 minutes in these breakout rooms. Oh, hello. Yeah. Hello, uh -huh. it's so Welcome great to have back. you back. Sorry to kick you out of what I'm sure are wonderful conversations. Feel free to share your contact information in the chat if, you, if you've got somebody who you wanna connect with. Um, and I just want Virginia to share those links again. Um, so we would love to hear from you. I was just telling Yanti that many of our panelists today were our participants last time. So you <laughs> could be a panelist too, um, if you connect with us and, uh, take the survey and yes. And I love all of these emails going around and, uh, we will make sure to keep up this chat. If you would like to copy and paste some of these emails and, uh, keep them somewhere. Um, any final thoughts, comments, or questions? Yes, please take our survey. We would yeah, absolutely we... love to hear from you.
Very much so. We would, um, and we'd love also filling out the consent um, means that if you're if you're someone who's open to being interviewed for a follow up conversation, um, we have uh, we have some funds and to uh, to support. Yes, that's true. If you fill yeah. out the survey and then you um, are selected, which I'm hoping we can select most people who fill out the yeah. survey, and you do an interview, I, I believe it's a hundred dollars per interview. Yeah, which is pretty yep. great. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. It was great to have you. Thank you so much. Thank Wonderful you. Conversation. Thank, you thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thanks to everyone. Yeah. A lot of amazing uh, people using games out there. Yeah.